All right. Hello, I'm Kim Adamski, HIV Prevention Specialist at the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective. And uh, the Health Collective is located at 1841 Broad Street in the south end of Hartford. We do STD testing, sexual wellness visits, we have dental, we have support groups, education, um, all kinds of fun stuff. You can call us at 860-278-4163. And I am live today with Sharon Glassburn on the topic of polyamory. Can you introduce yourself, Sharon? I can. Um, my name is Sharon Glassburn. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist at the master's level. Um, I used to live in the Hartford area, which is how I know Kim. Um, I'm currently living and practicing in Chicago, and uh, my practice really focuses in populations that may or may not identify as some sort of sexual minority, which includes folks who are consensually non-monogamous. Awesome, thank you for that. So um, we have had Sharon on before. We had her talking about bisexual mental health. Um, that was during Bisexual Mental Health Month. And I can't remember what month that was, but I think it was it was still cold out. So sometime around there. <laughs> I think um, it was around April, but I don't remember if it was actually April. That sounds right. <laughs> All right, so Sharon, how would you define polyamory? Yeah, I believe it literally translates to many loves. And I think of polyamory as being one of several different types of consensual non-monogamy, one that can and often does include sexual non-monogamy, but there might be more heart involved. It might focus on more than one relationship. Um, occurring consensually and simultaneously at one time. And there are folks who still identify as consensually non-monogamous and might have more of an open arrangement, which could look like having multiple sexual partners, but where there's not as much emotional intimacy or overlap. There are some folks who identify more as relationship anarchists who don't um, like all the labels, don't like to create a hierarchy. They may or may not identify as polyamorous. But um, I won't spend too much time on the different labels, just stuff that falls under the umbrella together. Oh, you are, I can't hear you. I muted myself. I do um, it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> We're right next to the dental office, so I don't want to have the chatting <laughs> interfere. Um, okay, so what is the difference between polyamory and polygamy? Because I That's think a great question. Confused. Yeah. Po um, polygamy may or may not be a type of polyamory, um, but polygamy refers to a person who identifies as a man having multiple wives or multiple um, female identified partners. It's a more of a marriage arrangement mm -hmm. and um, is not usually what folks are talking about when they're talking about polyamory. Okay, so how is polyamory different from cheating then? Mm, also a really good question. If you're cheating, you are not practicing polyamory, so they are mutually exclusive. I mean, folks who identify as polyamorous may have breaches of trust, may have betrayal. Folks in any type of relationship structure can have breaches of trust and betrayal. But the point of polyamory is that everyone involved in whatever type of relationship structure, whatever type of relationship constellation is aware of the other folks in the equation and consenting to wow. non-exclusivity. Okay, so cheating is when your partner doesn't know and is probably gonna be upset about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Polyamory is where everybody's uh, got an arrangement, they're happy with it, they talk about it, etc. Yeah, the goal is that everyone's happy with it yes. and they're working towards happiness together. Awesome. All right. That's a, that's a pretty easy to understand difference, I guess. Um, so would you be comfortable explaining a little bit about your experiences with polyamory? Totally. Um, yeah, it's not all professional. I, <laughs> I was thinking of the phrase preparing for this, something like, isn't there a quote that's like, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I'm, like, oh, I'm teaching about polyamory because right now I'm like functionally pretty monogamous. I think of myself 
uh, no matter what. Um, and I would say for more than half of my life, I have been in some sort of non-monogamous relationship structure on and off. Um, and some of that is related to being pansexual or bisexual. Some of that is related to having differing sexual interests from former partners and folks who want to practice like kink in different relationship structures, wanting to experience um, different gender presentations in different relationships. And I mean, a big thing is folks just having different uh, availability and different resources around time. I think that that's like one of the less romantic reasons to explore consensual non-monogamy. So it's it's something that's been on and off. Right now I'm in more of a monogamous arrangement, um, but it's something that I think most of the folks that I know personally and most of the folks I work with who are consensually non-monogamous or polyamorous um, have not necessarily functionally been in multiple relationships for an indefinite long-term period of time. Something right. that ebbs and flows often. So kind of a um, sometimes a polyamorous in spirit, but not in a practical time constraints. <laughs> yeah, I, I was also thinking um, as, a, as a marriage and family therapist, I like to think of us as a professional identity as maybe a little more poly than other types of mental health professionals, just because sometimes I'm meeting with one person in a relationship or family member. Sometimes I'm meeting with the whole relationship constellation. Sometimes I'm meeting with a pair and I like to collaborate with other providers too. Certainly not everyone who identifies as an LMFT or who was trained as one practices that way, but they, they really inform each other. My political and professional and personal values around polyamory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's the same as having a therapist who says that they are LGBTQ friendly as opposed to LGBTQ, like informed and affirming yeah. kind of same idea. Yes. Okay. So let's say I'm poly and I'm dating. How would you say would be a good way to approach the subject with somebody I'm interested in? Mm, I think that's awesome to think about far in advance, as far in advance as you can. And I think it depends a lot on whether you have other partners in the mix. I think everyone's ethics around this is going to be different. I think that it depends on how you say you're poly, which makes me think that it's an identity in this situation, like that it's something you identify as it's like core to who you are your sense of who you are in relationship if that's the case I recommend mentioning it as soon as you can possibly even before the first date or on the first date because if that's a part of who you are you want to be able to rule out potential partners that's not going to work for just to spare everyone the heartache. I think that's one of the biggest reasons that folks in non-monogamous arrangements break up is because folks think they can do it and then it doesn't actually work for what they need for secure attachment, for mm -hmm. secure relationships. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now what if um, the person I'm being approached by is Polly? What should I think about and like weigh before deciding whether to pursue a relationship with them? I think that's a beautiful question too. I would say if you are being approached by someone who is poly and you may or may not identify that way, you want to think about are they in a relationship structure that could even make room for you? Are they going to have availability for dating in a way that's going to help you feel secure? Are they looking for a long-term or casual or sexual relationship structure or frequency that makes sense for your needs? I would say like we can be idealistic about these things, but everyone I know self-included learns these things through trial and error. So there can be, you know, some injuries along the way. And I, I would say the big part of it is communication. But one of the ways you can know your limits is to think about the relationships in which you've been the happiest and the relationships you've been the least happy and what those big triggers were. And also who are your relationship role models and why? Just thinking a lot about like what works for you and what works for people who are most 
like you. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, trial and error is an important part of all relationships, right? Because I mean, every time I've dated somebody, I've learned about what I like and don't like. And 100%. Learning experience. So, mm -hmm. and then hopefully oh. get better and better at relationships every time. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that another big thing would be like, again, one of the less romantic parts of dating and consensual non-monogamy is talking about sexual boundaries and talking about sexual health, like might be where you come in and educating folks. But I think that depending on the level of sexual involvement and the levels of risk there. Yeah, no, that's definitely important. Oh. I mean, we get a lot of folks in multiple partners and there's different risk mm -hmm. factors. Like obviously having sex with more people puts you at higher risk for STDs, but it depends on your sexual network. Like if you're yes. in like a throuple and it's a closed throuple, obviously getting STDs is less likely. But if you're like in a relationship and you're like having sex with people from the bar or something, you want to mm -hmm. uh, think a little bit more about your sexual health risk and stuff. So absolutely. And I would say all of this has been coming up in interesting ways in the last year and a half through the pandemic, which you've probably oh, yeah. been talking about too. <laughs> Lots of pandemic sexual health stuff. Yeah, we didn't used to think about respiratory illness as a sexually transmitted infection, but <laughs> a lot of the stuff still applies. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about a poly person's partners meeting each other? Mm, I think that, well, I, I think and I have heard so many differing feelings about this. Um, I'll link to this in the chat towards the end, but a book that I really like, it's called the Polyamory Breakup Book, talks about some of the common reasons that folks go into polyamorous arrangements and some of the most common reasons why they don't work out. And one of her bullet points there for reasons it doesn't work out might be that folks have differing styles of non-monogamy that best meets their needs. So some people to feel secure want to know the other partners it helps them experience trust it helps them experience compersion which is like the inverse of jealousy or is something that you can experience along with jealousy but it's like more of a positive connotation yeah. and so if you're someone who really needs that more integrated model of polyamory to experience trust and security and your partner is someone who needs more compartmentalization, who needs more privacy, who needs more one-to-one -one time with their partners. That's normal. Like those differences are always going to exist in some way, like and create some tension. But if you're like on opposite ends of the spectrum, it might not work out. Okay. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. So I have two anonymous questions so far. So I hope you're ready to be Yay. on the spot. Yeah, um, I hope so. Is, uh, how can I help my long-term partner feel more secure when I'm visibly feeling over the moon about a new partner? It's so like that uh, new partner energy, new relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that when we are experiencing new relationship energy or NRE, it is like, I love the phrase over the moon. It is. It's such a drug. <laughs> it's something that feels great and it's not long lasting, right? So reminding them and yourself that this is a normal developmental stage of any relationship. And then I really believe in making like, I would say sacred time, but special time that is yours and your pre-existing or longer term partners and not messing with it. Or if something comes up, which should be rare, that does impact it, making sure that you're like compensating by creating additional times that you know your partner has access to. That's one of the other really big reasons that folks in polyamorous arrangements break up is that they don't have good time management skills or they think that they can sustain more relationships than they actually can. So the next I've been, oh, oh go ahead. Is there another anonymous one? Yeah, so it actually relates to what you just said. Um, cool. Do you ever have difficulty managing your social and professional life when you have multiple romantic partners? And I guess implicitly, what are some ideas for what to do to that? Have I ever had difficulty managing my relationships while managing like personal and professional yeah, stuff or vice versa? 
Well, I am in a super privileged position where while it does impact income, I have a lot of control over my own schedule. And I would say almost the opposite occurs. Like if I have a bunch of clients, I have probably less emotional and relational capacity in my personal life, but it's also something that I can um, adjust accordingly, which is not true for most folks with traditional employers. So I want to like own that there's a lot of privilege there, even if I might have less, a less lucrative career during the times that I've been like the most actively um, polyamorous or dating the most. Um, sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. I think that um, being realistic about your limits, being realistic about how much alone time you need or how much time to like unwind and recharge you need is important, but also really difficult when you're in NRE or when you're in that like drug phase because every part of you wants to take on more of the relationship until it like fills up your life. Sometimes it's just hard for any like adult in general to schedule. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Which is, I, I, like I joked at the beginning of this, like the big reason why it took a while for us to get on the calendar together was because oh we were gosh, like, well, yeah. what about this Tuesday? What about this day? <laughs> Real life. It happens with dating all the time. Did I answer it in full? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Sounded, I, sounded good. <laughs> I would say I am more of a geek about scheduling and creating personal Sabbath days and all of those things than most people. <laughs> or I try to be. And part of it is my identity as a couples therapist, but part of it is like my strong desire for security mm -hmm. in the relationships I maintain, whether they're personal or professional. Mm -hmm. All right. So now on to the topic of communication. Obviously, it's important in all relationships. You have to communicate your needs and stuff. But when you're in multiple relationships, communication is probably extra important, right? So absolutely. What kinds of things should poly partners be checking in about? Besides yeah. the relationship stuff, obviously. I think that checking in regularly no matter what you're checking in about is important there can be this tendency to let your like older relationships fall to the wayside because you're like ah, eh, they're good we like know each other we especially if you're nesting partners or you live together like oh we see each other all the time like to keep checking in about quality time and make sure that it's meeting both people's needs to keep checking in about safety whether that's sexual safety or emotional safety mm -hmm. and to sort of normalize jealousy. Like if someone's experiencing emotional distress and it's like during a newer phase of a relationship, that's pretty normal and is usually part of like a growing pain. It doesn't have to mean that it's like prescribing doom somewhere mm -hmm. or that things aren't going to work out. And then to just make sure along the way you're checking in about boundaries, which my general experience and observation is that boundaries tend to relax over time. So what your partner is comfortable with or what you're comfortable with now might not be the same like one year from now or two years from now, which can feel like a really long time again when you're uh, intoxicated or over the moon with new relationship stuff, but mm -hmm. you'll get there. Yeah, definitely. Um, what are the, some of the most common issues you see as a therapist in poly relationships? P poor management of <laughs> time and energy resources is a big one. Um, I talked a little bit about wanting different relationship structures. Some people really want and really need a primary secondary model where they have a primary partner and their other partners are considered secondary or just not as integral to their like daily lived life or don't have as long term of commitment. Sometimes most people want veto power about other partners and dates. Um, I would say, and, and then maybe by contrast, their partner wants multiple primary partners or wants relationship anarchy or needs those things. Mm -hmm. That's 
something that people might try to feel out early in the game, but might ultimately be a deal breaker over time. Another thing that I see quite a bit is folks opening up the relationship sexually and then developing feelings along the way. So people, especially folks who are new to poly, might have an idea that they can be open without catching feelings. And that is true for many, many people, but it's not true for everyone. This is a stereotype, and I try not to paint any demographic with broad brush strokes, but in the book that I was just referencing um, by Kathy Labriola, she said in her clinical experience and in her research with interviewing folks who are poly, the group that she sees best able to do casual, like sexually open stuff or to carry out even a don't ask, don't tell arrangement is for like gay men or men who have sex with men. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of other sexual identities might not be able to um, handle it. And I don't mean that like gay men can inherently handle more emotions differently. I just, that's something she's observed. And yeah, I have anecdotally, observed as well. anecdotally from the clinic, I can, I mean, I didn't study it or anything, but that, that's right. from what I've seen. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, before we close and everything, I just want to talk a little bit about sexual safety again with multiple partners, because that's my, my interest area and also important. So anyone who's sexually active uh, should be getting tested every six to 12 months or if they've been exposed or if they have a new partner. Um, so that's like CDC recommendations. Uh, we do offer STD testing at our clinic on Mondays and Thursdays uh, by appointment. Um, another thing is a lot of partners will, or like a lot of um, relationships will include consistent condom use because that is the best way to prevent STDs and the only way to prevent all STDs. It doesn't hurt to take PrEP if that's something you're interested in, which can prevent HIV. Uh, it's very effective. Um, also, a lot of arrangements include with your primary partner not using a condom, but with everybody else using one. So make sure you stick to that boundary. Have a condom with you because that makes it a lot more likely that you'll use one. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I always have condoms just to give out to my friends if, I, if they <laughs> need them because I don't want any of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll like have like 10 at a time. Like um, the Mary so Poppins of sexual safety. <laughs> that's what I try to think of myself as. Um, so yeah, and just communication, not only about sexual health, like I'm talking about, but also about everything like Sharon was mentioning. That's all really important stuff. Yes. I recommend communication at all times about everything. <laughs> Which is really, really hard. And sometimes you do have to pick your battles. But when people's bodily safety and emotional safety is on the line, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to provide my contact info for anyone who has questions about sexual health. Uh, yeah. You can call me at 860-278-4163, extension 111. Always feel free to leave a message uh, because I do answer voicemails. And you can also email me at kima at hglhc.org. Um, now, how can folks get in touch with you, Sharon? Yeah, um, I'm not going to give my phone number because that feels Bye. unlikely to reach me best at this point. My website is www.curiositycounseling.com or you can email me at Sharon at curiositycounseling.com. The website does have my other forms of contact, but email is the best way to reach me right now. Um, and then Kim, with your consent, I was hoping I could plug some books related to this topic for folks who want to read more, do more, learn more, because I feel super passionately <laughs> about some Ooh. of the authors. Um, I even brought uh, a book I read this year. It has like changed my life in how I think about all of my relationships. It's called Polysecure. I think it's backwards on the Zoom screen, but it's by Jessica Fern. Highly recommend. The subtitle is Attachment, Trauma, and Consensual Non-Monogamy. I think it's a really good read, whether you are an experienced non-monogamous person or just starting. I think it covers a lot of really important bases. Um, Kathy Labriola is the author I've mentioned twice before this. She has two really important resources. One of them is called the Jealousy Workbook. And I think that's an excellent 
exploration tool, whether it's for yourself or with a partner, not just for jealousy, but for determining whether a polyamorous relationship structure could even work for you. It's like identifying things that are triggers, identifying ways of working through difficult feelings mm -hmm. and figuring out what is a hard limit and what is like a growth edge for you. The I actually have that book, the Jealousy Workbook. I love it. Long it's the so good. Workbook. <laughs> they, they come right hand in hand. Yes. <laughs> I think a lot of those tools are good, even if you're practicing monogamy. Oh, yeah. um, the Polyamory Breakup Book is her more recent book. I think it came out just two years ago or so. Um, and then I'm just going to slam a bunch of other stuff in the chat that I don't have as much time to talk okay. about. Those are my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of good stuff mm -hmm. out there. Um, is the chat an okay place to put it? Uh, yeah, if you can message them to me as well, that way I'll put it in the description of the video when I upload it too, for folks. One hundred percent. Want Where'd it. our window go? Here we are. Chat window. Yay. Okay. All right. I will message that to you as well. Perfect. Yeah, I've um. Oh yeah, I've read a few of these. Mm -hmm. Good ones. Oh, I liked Sex at Dawn. That one was really interesting. <laughs> I feel like Sex at Dawn was the first book I encountered yeah. about consensual non-monogamy. Um, the only one of these that I haven't personally encountered, and I would say this is the book that a lot of poly folks that I know personally recommend the most, I just haven't sat down with it, is Opening Up by Tristan Tayormino. Mm -hmm. um, designer relationships is really short, so if you ever want to, like, skim the basics it's i think it's just over 100 pages or something it's like, like designed to be an airplane <laughs> read yeah yeah i do too cool all right well i will be posting this and um let me just double check if there's no more anonymous questions nope just sure. all right beautiful cool. well thank you so much Thanks for, for having me again, sharon <laughs> absolutely it was really good to see you definitely cool I will follow up. You too. Take okay. care. Bye.